Experts here representing three different brands <clears throat> and uh, three different product types, frankly. And we've listened to a lot of presentations about what the guest is looking for in the industry today and what the expectations are from human touch to the level of service and how design affects that. And it's pretty exciting to have Mitch here from Trump Hotels, Jeannie from MGM, and Mari from Hyatt to tell us how they're affecting that or influencing that in, in their various uh, sectors and, and brands. So we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with Mitch, uh, again, with Trump Hotels and your product. Uh, and we've had a lot of conversations over the past few days, and I'd, I'd like this to be an interactive conversation as much as possible. Mitch, uh, your product is about that human touch and high level of service focused with the Trump Hotels. But now you're launching two new brands uh, with your group. And what I think is interesting to hear is how are you going to continue that with some of the other brands that you're developing that are more, uh, that they're not five-star properties, for instance. So how, how do you continue that, that brand? Sure, sure. So our, our five-star product is, is very well known for not only just its uh, you know, level of standards within the actual asset and, and the architecture and design, but also mainly in the service level. Um, on the luxury level, it's, it's very intuitive. So it's kind of an expect, it, or the, the guest is expecting to know that they're going to be taken care of and you don't really need to, it, it's kind of like they, they know in advance what they're looking for. And so, you know, we'll set up rooms with the exact kind of drinks that they want. And that's all, and that, that training occurs even all the way down to the, you know, the room cleaners that say, okay, we saw a couple Diet Cokes in the garbage can, maybe they brought them in. Well, that's what we know the next time to put in the room when they, when they show up. So it's a very intuitive, uh, um, level of service. And then as it relates to um, technology and, and kind of not human touch as you start going down more into the lifestyle brands and, and into the mid-scale space, what we're doing there is we're not at all getting rid of the human element. I think that that's one of the tenements of, of the, the Trump organization. And um, it would be a mistake for us to not try to carry on that level of service. I mean, we created these brands so that other customers could experience uh, somewhat of a Trump experience, but not at the same price point. So to get rid of it through um, replacement of, of technology and not having that human factor, I think, would be a mistake. So what we are doing is creating an interactive app that's going to be a lot more robust. So we will have that you know, millennial touch and things that uh, can um, interact with a reservation, you know, whether it be scheduling events. But it, for us overall, it's just trying to keep in communication constantly with the customer base so that once they are on site, then the human element can take back over. And how do you augment that overall experience in, in ways that don't really detract from having a true hospitality? Because that's what, really what we're all about. We're here as humans to connect. And, uh, and what we're doing in, in terms of the ethos of, especially with Scion, uh, a little bit less with American Idea because it's, it's more mid-scale, but with Scion as our lifestyle brand, the, the overall goal when we're training our employees is to say, if you were staying with your friend, how would that interaction be? And, and to try to think that way as an employee. Every employee needs to be an ambassador, and every employee should be treating that person as if they were their friend, coming over for, you know, for a weekend or whatever it may be, and that's how you would interact with them. And that comes by empowering the workers to say, think on your own feet. Okay, here's kind of certain things that might be you know, easy go-tos to say, but you know, just speak for yourself. If this is your friend, you wouldn't say, oh, let me look up, you know, uh, time out in New York to see what's the top five things going on. You'd say, okay, let's, 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 let's huddle on this. Let's figure out what exactly you want. And you can speak on a very human level. And that's a lot more in the lifestyle-oriented space, whereas luxury you know, might be a little bit more, all right, we, we have your tickets here, sir. Everything's identified and everything's kind of laid out in your portfolio. Um, and it's a little bit like toned down as you, as you, as you drop down the scale. On the, on the uh, mid-scale space, we, do, we will potentially uh, um, have some locations have a, um, an optionality for mobile check-in, but for the most part, we don't want to lose that touch point. And we want the, the customer to feel like they're arriving to their friend's house. So when you look at design uh, for all three brands through American Idea, we talked a little bit about this, 
it sounds like you're, you're really not talking about designing a product, a physical building. You're, you're really looking at design as the entire experience for that guest throughout. Without a doubt. I mean, the level of design for overall across every brand, the bar has been raised significantly. I mean, you're, even on the mid-scale space, you're seeing some really cool boutique you know, type products coming out. And then as it goes up the chain scale, the, you know, the, the bar has been set. So having you know, just a really superior asset just doesn't do it as much anymore and doesn't keep the customers coming back. So for us, it's, it's not just the, the service element, but how do you keep in, in contact with them? How do you provide the customer with what they're looking for? Um, and, and being very smart about that in ways that, that attract them to come back, attract locals to be there, because overall, that's what the goal is, to not just be a destination for, for the traveler, but for overall everybody in the community. You use the example of the uh, charger for your phone mm -hmm. relative to, which is a detail, but it is a convenience at a hotel that can be frustrating for the traveler, whether leisure or, or business, and how you can, you can solve that problem at, at various levels of your product, and I thought that was a great example. Sure, sure. So for, for instance, in our Trump brand, if we see uh, a, a room attendant sees a, a cord for their iPhone or whatever, and it's just dangling out there, and maybe they don't have the, the USB charges in that particular room, you know, our staff is trained to put a little note with them. You know, you see, you may have forgot your charger base, and so we'll, we'll provide that to them. That's kind of the intuitive nature I'm referencing, whereas, you know, something in Scion or American Idea wouldn't necessarily go to that level, but, you know, maybe we'll have a printed out checklist, kind of like a school sheet. Hey, if you forgot any of these items, and maybe the room attendant will highlight charger base. We've got them at our front desk. Don't, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. No, that's great. Very nice. Well, I'm going to move on to Jeannie here, and then we can, uh, you know, keep this going and feel free to ask questions as you see fit. Jeannie, uh, originally when we talked last week, we were going to talk about, uh, and I think we still are going to talk about, where uh, MGM sees itself positioning itself moving forward uh, and maybe moving away from more of a gaming uh, hotel to uh, entertainment. Clearly, there was an incident in Las Vegas last night that uh, raises some questions relative to that, but I don't, I don't know that we're in any way prepared to address that, but we are do have the ability, I think, to talk about how MGM as a whole will bring entertainment or the feeling of entertainment into your properties, and uh, I think we have to table the other conversation. Right, and we have, um, we have two key strategies that we're employing to, um, to take us forward. Um, one is called Welcome to the Show, and the other one is called We Are the Show. And to just give you a, just a kind of 50 cent tour of that, um, Welcome to the Show is really about um, our company becoming very visible as an entertainment company um, nationally, globally, rather than the first thing you think about um, when you hear MGM Resorts is the big green building on the corner of Tropicana and the Strip. So um, there is a very, um, a very big campaign underway. Um, you'll see it on national television. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing, and it, it just conveys the excitement of um, what, what all our offerings are. Um, we Are the Show is more about um, the employees and how important they are to, to bringing the show to, to our guests. So we've put a lot of, um, actually a lot of time into creating um, a very, it's a very specific program of training that all the employees get, for, whether you're frontline or you're um, at a corporate level. So um, that is really designed to bring more um, guest loyalty and help the, help the guests understand that you know, we're not just you know, this, this mega, mega resort where they're just a, a face in the crowd. It's, it's really important that they, um, they feel the, the contact, the human contact with, um, with our staff because they're the ones that are there um, on the front line, as we call it. Um, we Are the Show is, um, it, it talks um, about just some basics. I know basics, we were talking about back to basics in something last night and that kind of had a bad connotation, but we call it show service basics and um, S is for smile and greet. Just something as simple as smiling and greeting our guests. It's amazing how, you know, that really didn't always happen. Um, H is for hear their story. So, you know, the guest always has a need or perhaps a concern. 
um, own is own the experience. So our employees are, are they're empowered to, um, to deal with guest recovery and to make a decision um, about um, getting something that the guest requested or needed without having to go to a higher manager um, and make that happen. So they, um, again, they've been able to, to make that experience, oops, forgot about that, um, make that experience their own and, and assist. Um, wow is, well, W is the wow. So um, when you've wowed um, the guest, that's a, that's a wonderful feeling. So that's, a, that's, that's really been our focus lately. And you know, I know that's not about design necessarily. Um, and my world is designed for the most part, but it's just amazing how that flows over into you know the physical property that is that is there and, and what is offered there. And we talked about this last night, it was specific to your properties. I mean, the MGM Grand, for instance, a, a major property, huge lobby, and has some challenging design. Um, elements like the arrival sequence and how do, how do you make that an experience for entertainment for your guest as they arrive at the Port Cochere or they enter the lobby and there's several hundred people in there and they don't have a sense of how long it's going to take to check in, where are they standing, they're standing around with bags, but you talked about that sequence of arrival through to the guest room and, make, and how important that was to you and bringing entertainment to that. And, you know, it is so critical. Um, one of our handicaps, I suppose, is that um, it's a long way from the, the arrival to, to the ultimate, you know, to your guest room destination. And there has to be a level of um, wayfinding that is intuitive, um, not confusing, um, welcoming. Um, it, it's, just, it's just critical to create that, that kind of sequence that, um, that works. And so, you know, there's a bit of a buildup at the arrival, and then by the time you get checked in, you know, now you're like, okay, where, where am I going? And, you know, the most obvious thing would be to employ signage or some other type of wayfinding. Um, historically, um, casinos are not really great with having good wayfinding signage, and I think that idea, you know, is, is a thing of the past now. So. Um, most often, you have to go through the casino to find your um, where you're staying, so find your room. And so we've really gone away from just let's confuse everyone and they you know meander around the casino until they find you know where they're going, and they're very frustrated by then. So we've made it easier, and um, you know signage is just one one critical point of that. Um, but as you, you know, as you continue through the space and now you're into the, um, to the elevator lobby, even that can be confusing because you've got, you know, elevators that only go to certain floors or they only cross over on certain floors and having that um, to be um, uh, clarified for people is really helpful. Um, as well as, you know, we are in the elevator. Well, guess what? It's, you know, 50 stories so your elevator can get pretty, um, pretty static if you, if you, you know, don't take that opportunity to further orient guests. Um, and, in, you know, there's a buildup, and, and there, the buildup continues through the, through the elevator experience and the corridor experience, and then you're finally in your guest room. But there's definitely um, an importance to not breaking that continuum. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to a few things there. Uh, Mari, Mari uh, you, you and I have chatted as well as with the group about what Hyatt is doing in, uh, relative to health and wellness mm -hmm. and uh, an opportunity that you see as a company to move that forward. Right. I mean, I think the, the reason I chose to focus on that was sort of the initial topic of the evolving guest and how yeah. we are looking to meet the needs of, of the guest and, and looking at the images that I selected sort of reminded why I selected them, which really has to do with um, people wanting experience, people wanting um, design or hotels to reflect um, the location that they're visiting, and then also to reflect how they're living their lives. And so that's really the notion of the wellness component, is that we're looking at, our guests are asking for um, an enhanced um, 
lifestyle experience and wellness experience. And um, we recently purchased two companies. One was is Miraval, which is a, a, has a very small footprint, one property in Tucson, one that we're um, converting in Austin, and then another one soon to happen in Lenox. And some of these images are actually from the original um, Miraval. And this is a, a destination wellness resort and um, is really um, unique in its offering. It's gonna stay as an independent entity within Hyatt. It's not that we're bringing in brands and then we're just gonna Hyattize everything. And that's sort of a word we use, Hyattize. Um, it's about learning from people who are experts in that field to see what we can learn from them that they can continue to operate separately and then we can bring in components. I also included actually images of our new office space and the reason I did that was that I feel like um, we're showing in our office that we're putting our money where our mouth is in terms of how we are living our lives actually reflects how our guests are living their lives. And there's a strong hospitality component to our new office space and there's actually a wellness component as well. We're running our own food and beverage um, which has a, a sort of a health-mindedness to it, which is quite funny because some associates are like, where are the burgers and fries? <laughs> uh, but um, everyone was given a water bottle when they, they moved into the office. And you're actually forced to walk through the office, which is a really interesting thing, to go to these sort of um, almost co-working spaces where we have a cafeteria or coffee stations so that there's a lot more um, social interaction that we didn't have in our previous office. So, all these things are sort of combining, I think, that we're reflecting the way people are living their lives, and then we're designing to the way that they're living right. their lives. Um, and for us, I think it's a, it's a really interesting moment to really learn from other industries and figure out how we can begin to sort of weave those lessons into our more standard properties. And that's a good segue, because I think, uh, Jeannie, you brought up the question of who do we look at uh, as being in the hospitality industry? Who do we look at for examples of things that they're doing well that we can learn from. And you're saying you're looking at health and wellness, for instance, and bringing that in. Jeannie, Mitch, what, what, where are you guys going for inspiration other than the typical book of consultants? Do you want to go first? Sure, sure. <laughs> um, for us, it, it's, it's, it's obviously, you know, just being aware of what trends are going on, uh, especially as, as you see, you know, everything from apartments to you know, hotels becoming a hospitality solution with this live, work, play environment. And so really taking an opportunity to how do you um, not only you know, play that up and exemplify that, but capture additional revenue from that sources. So what we're doing, uh, especially with our, our Scion brand, um, and actually even in our Trump brand too, we're, we're changing a little bit. We mentioned last night um, with our Vancouver project, we, we have a nightclub in, in, our, in our pool area of our Vancouver hotel with a dance floor that comes out of the pool. So that's not really something you would see at a five-star experience, but it's, it's being aware of the trends going on and makes sense for that market. Um, so that's something that's new. For, for Scion, uh, without a doubt, we're really uh, embracing this, this co-working um, trend that's going on. And so making the, the public spaces, or as, if it's conversion opportunity, taking a, a ballroom, something like this, that, that may be repurposed or has additional revenue potential by activating it throughout the day, or having that flexibility of, of activation so that you could still use it as a ballroom if necessary, but activating it during the day not only just increases the um, interest from, from the traveler, but also the locals. So that, that the locals know that I can come there just as they do going to a Starbucks and have you know, great Wi-Fi and access to a cup of coffee or some sort of small F&B you know, offerings and get their work done. That should be a way to you know, enhance the overall guest experience as well. I think with... Um and this is probably with anyone, um, we, we garner a lot of information from um, what our guests are saying on social media. And that is, I don't know how many years it's been, but that's just suddenly now the way that we get a lot of that intelligence. Um, you know, not little focus cards that, who said we threw them out last night? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the social media thing, it's kind of a good news, bad news thing, um, but it's just so, so useful. Um, you know, not only do you, do you get the, the, the kudos when you do something right, but you also are instantly alerted when there's something that's really not, um, not preferred or favored. So I would say that that is where we're getting a lot of, a, a lot of vital information from. 
I would agree. I think we use a lot of, of that kind of data to help inform our decisions and, and to really hear the guests. And it's not specifically the, the sort of the surveys that you get when you stay right. in a hotel. We're actually really trolling social media, right. right? We're pulling information from a variety of sources that are not necessarily directed towards us, mm -hmm. but we're, we're capturing how people are inhabiting our spaces and what they're saying that they love and what they're saying that they don't love. Um, and, and it's really helpful because it, again, we're catering to the guests. And you know we're a relatively small company by comparison to some of these larger companies. Um, that can be our differentiator, is that we can be more flexible, more <coughs> tailored, both to our guests and to our owners in terms of the product that we're developing. Yeah, I think it's, it's been interesting for the past several weeks to hear the, the three brands talk about just guest experience and, and, and what we're doing to enhance that versus any of the physical design, which mm -hmm. two of you are intimately involved in the building, and it's all been about how do we make that guest experience better. I think that was emphasized today, earlier in the presentation, about materials and finishes and relative to what, what the guest experience is and what can make or break a property. Are there any questions in the audience for the panel? <coughs> wow. Really? OK, we're done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> what can, uh, Mitch, what can you tell us about uh, American Idea? So American Idea was, was born off of, um, again, just kind of looking at where we are within the five-star space. You can't put a Trump five-star you know, across the nation or in a lot of MSAs. Um, you know, then looking at a four star, where could you put those? And there's a lot more places. And, and with the, the, um, the American Idea brand, it was really geared to, it could be anywhere. So looking at the map and saying anywhere within America, whether it be a top tier MSA or, you know, our first four and really small towns of, you know, 10 to 15,000 people in Mississippi. And those are, are and, and really what we're kind of realizing is uh, as, a, as a brand that's nim nimble and has the ability to make, you know, decisions that are based on asset level versus an overall brand standard, you know, what we're, what we're creating and didn't even realize it at the time was it's almost a boutique mid-scale space. And there are other brands out there creating that, but um, when we're looking at conversion opportunities, which is the majority of American idea, we, we have the, the ability to make a nimble decision to say, this is what this customer base wants and this is the ROI for the owner and why we are doing that versus just trying to slap down a book of brand standards that may not make sense for that particular market or taking assets that have great bones, great locations. We talked about having a, um, you know, some really neat exterior quarter assets that you're seeing some of these boutique uh, you know, people doing. They're creating these really charming experiences and it's, a, it's, a, it's an asset that wouldn't be accepted in a lot of the major brands, but we believe that there's a life to them and somehow or another we can create a, a great story and a narrative to that that translates down to the guests, which ultimately translate to a, a higher ADR. And then specific to the built, built product and, and design, uh, Jeannie, what are some of the exciting things that you were doing with MGM that you, you think are going to be going to stay? Uh, in? Um, I think that I, I, I won't go to hotel rooms yet because that's such an easy crutch to, to right. go into. But right. one of the things I've seen, um, and, and we're doing it as, long, as well as others, um, meeting and conference spaces are becoming so much more sophisticated and um, so much more flexible. Um, we're expanding, um, for example, um, at the Aria, and it's actually a case of adaptive reuse. Um, the uh, building that housed the theater for, I don't know if anyone even remembers, there was an Elvis show initially <laughs> there in that showroom, and then it became a Cirque show. And um, it's now being converted into additional meeting and conference space um, at the ARIA. And there are a number of kind of interesting spaces that are um, um, more intimate, more flexible, um, lots of great executive kind of retreat breakout spaces, in addition to the you know, million mile long ballroom space. Um, and that's being done in other properties of, of ours as well. Um, so I think that it, it's almost like we can't, we can't build it fast enough right. to accommodate the different needs that are happening in um, various conferencing and meeting um, venues. And to use your definition of it, the easier side of things, uh, the hotel guest room? Yeah, that, I mean, I could just babble about that forever. <laughs> um, but one of the things I'm really noticing is that um, 
I, I guess I call it the lightening of the, um, the clutter and the heaviness of all of the furniture that's in guest rooms. And this isn't even necessarily related to, oh, I'm you know, maybe more in a core property level rather than a luxury property. I'm seeing it in, um, in all sectors. Um, it's just not necessary anymore to have um, a giant wardrobe with doors and, you know, everything's, but the kitchen sink is stored in there. Um, more open storage kind of ideas and, and storage the way really people use it when they're only there for 2.1 days or whatever the statistic is. So, um, you know, who needs a, a dresser with eight drawers in it for Pete's sake? That's just not relevant anymore. And I, I think everyone knows that, but it's taking a while to implement that into, um, into projects. It's, it's easy when it's a new project, but if it's a remodel project and that remodel doesn't come up for two years, you know, you've kind of just got to wait your turn. Um, but the materials in the rooms, too, are lightening up and simplifying. Everyone wants a, a sliding barn door on the bathroom instead of the swinging leaf door. Um, again, to make the space appear larger and be able to move about um, more easily in an existing bathroom. Um, flooring, not always carpet anymore. You know, if you can, if you're at a level where you have real wood, that's great, but a lot of people are going to the, what is it, it's called LVT for luxury vinyl tile. <laughs> but, you know, it makes sense and, you know, you put that in a space that formerly had carpet, for instance, and it's like, you know, this, this does make a difference. Um, you know, and technology is not so gimmicky now. Um, it's, you know, there's a big focus on it, but a lot, of, a lot of it is just people bring their, everything's portable technology, personal technology. So really all you need to provide is, you know, the hookup. So um, it's, it's really um, changing very rapidly. Oh, desks. I mean, who wants a desk anymore in their room? So, but they, you know, but they need that horizontal surface. So, how does that translate? And, um, um, you know, everyone had to have an ergonomic desk chair on casters. Why? You know, can't we find a chair that maybe is a little more multi-purpose, but I can, I can sit upright in it or lounge or, you know, or be comfortable in a number of functions. Um, so, you know, the individual pieces in the room, and we, we, had our, we had our talk about window treatments. You know, everybody wants to be hip and, and put in shades or um, some sort of a, a shade device and, and get away from draperies. And frankly, sometimes a sheer drapery in a blackout drapery is a very simple solution and it's the most functional. So it's not trying to jam in, you know, what was, you know, considered trendy, um, just because it, it's kind of bubbled up, you know, really thinking about maybe, you know, maybe we don't have to go off in that direction. I mean, building on what you're saying is that essentially sort of the influence of residential design is coming into hotels. Exactly. And has been over the last several years. Exactly. And I feel like in the past, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, hotels were really aspirational. They were, right. they were built as sort of the, the symbols of what you would aspire to in your own home. And I think now it's actually kind of going the other way, where people are living a certain way in their own homes, right. and when they go to a hotel, they don't want to be forced into some sort of antiquated way of living. On a, uh, you, you don't have a caster chair, right, a, a, in your home. You have a nice, comfortable chair, and mm -hmm. that's what, and you happen to work at your dining room table, or you happen mm -hmm. to work at your kitchen counter. Oh, and so I think the hotels are really starting to sort of blend those those nuances together to really create something that feels like something that represents you and your lifestyle. Yeah, it feels like, based on our conversations, we're seeing a trend to let, let's rein it in a little bit. Right? Exactly. It, it's become this playground where there's technology and all these wonderful things that we can throw in there and we're fighting for. But at the end of the day, I want to open the room, the door, and if I'm opening it to the left, the, the, the light switch is directly to my right and I can just turn on the lights and I can open and close the shades without trying to figure out how to work the, the, the lighting system on the iPad and yeah. unscrewing light bulbs. Uh, <laughs> I would never do such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was interesting when you were talking about uh, the, the wayfinding thing, and, and it dawned on me that it, it's, it, we talked about keeping the guest informed of how long it's going to take to check in or where the room's going to be, and 
providing information. I think that's what we all have. Mm -hmm. And we, we depend on that on our devices. It's that constant information, whether it's the news or our friends. And sometimes we, we arrive at a hotel and, and it's, it's the unknown of how long is it going to take that front desk person to check me in or where's my room going to be and, and how important that is in wayfinding. Because now wayfinding is a device, right? Uh, whether it's Waze or Google Maps, and I'm not suggesting we use that in a hotel. But it, it seems like there, there's a big gap between what we do at a large property, and mm -hmm, you seem mm -hmm. to be addressing that. Mm -hmm. I think the, you know, the wayfinding thing is so much more than signage as well. Right. Um, even when you're in a property that perhaps it gets repetitive in some way, whether it's corridors or, well, we'll just use corridors. Um, even the artful placing of of artwork, um, creating something a little different at each at each turn, let's say, um, it's a memory point for people, and so they start to assign things in their mind. Oh, I know that I'm, you know, I know I'm going in the right direction because I've passed the yellow pear painting several times. So it's, I think, you know, it's. It's not just signage, although signage is super critical and, and it's, it's sometimes the most sensible. Question? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, um, well, for us, I mean, you see the explosion of soft brands occurring, and, and, and really what those are, just a reflection of what is the core essence of the experience that you're, that you're going for as, as a soft brand um, um, owner or manager, you know, and so keeping a level of standards there. So it, it's, it, and that kind of also jives in with what's going on overall in the design, where people are looking for authenticity to the location, and how do you do that if you have a hard fast brand standard, so it should be, and what we're doing in our group at least, is okay, the, you know, maybe the brand standard doesn't say a specific type of tile, but does that market need, you know, a, a carpet, or does that need a tile? Okay, well, as long as it makes sense for that particular market, then, and that's also a benefit of having a nimble company, we can say, okay, that, that's part of the brand standard for that, but that really just boils down to the, the bureaucratic ability to make decisions on the fly for what makes sense and the ROI for the owners um, and, and just try to keep costs down. Or, and sometimes it's not even really about keeping costs down, so to speak. It's about where do you put and allocate the dollars appropriately. So, you know, if you're looking at a renovation that, uh, you know, if it still may be 10, 20 grand a key or whatever it may be, but those 10, 20 grand a key are the, the highest impact dollars. So for the owner's sake, at least they can say, okay, this is translating into more rates or more revenue potential for me. Whereas before, I just said, oh, yeah, I just needed four square tiles in the bathroom for no reason. Um, so I think having that, that awareness of what makes sense for each uh, location and, and, and the market um, really goes all the way up the chain in, in command. I also just think that um, brands are no longer about a specific look. So it's not as though, you know, I can use fast food examples. McDonald's looks different than Burger King. Um, I think it's about the sort of the security of our umbrella brand. So if, if you're Hyatt or Hilton or MGM, there's, I think there's a security from a guest perspective that there's a, a baseline of quality and service that they're going to achieve in that particular product. And then I think from our perspective, it, again, we don't have really any prototypical brand. So it's not that you're going to have a specific look and feel at any one of our hotels, but we do have a set of guest touch points. And those touch points are sort of the red thread that sort of run through the design at any one of our brands. So a certain check-in experience at Park Hyatt is always going to be a similar check-in experience. Um, and then a check-in experience at a Hyatt-centric is going to be also consistent across the brand. So once you begin to stay in those properties, I think that you, you sort of find your home where you feel the most comfortable, and you know you have the, the, the comfort level, I would say, that, that you're going to have that, a similar experience and a similar quality of experience if you are going to you know, the centric in Montevideo is one of the images I have here, but then we have a centric in Chicago. So it's that kind of, oh, I, I think I'm going to try that because it 
those centric properties, well, they're always in a cool neighborhood and they always have a really great restaurant. And while I know it's gonna be a comfortable stay because, well, Hyatt always has a really comfortable bed. Um, and I've never been to Montevideo, so I'm gonna trust this brand with my stay um, because I've had good experiences in the past. So to me, that's where that sort of brand differentiation comes from, but it's not a specific look and feel. It makes me think about um, something sort of interesting. We're, you know, we're only, like in Las Vegas, we have 12 brands, if you look at all the properties that we have there. But there are some operational consistencies and efficiencies that we um, have started to build into those properties so that they're less, um, I guess they're less independent, but it keeps the um, guest expectation um, consistent from property to property. And there's simple things like um, there's, a, there's a corporate standard for the bedding and the mattress sets. Um, there's a standard that we have for um, the AV that's technology that's in the room. Um, and it started out by just giving us um, better efficiencies, but what it's really done is it's helped um, people understand what to expect in, in even though those, they're 12 different brands, they understand that there's a consistency there. Now, it's interesting also, just because my role in the, on the development end also crosses over into the legal side when you're getting into contracts and you have to have, okay, what is the brand standard? At some point, the buck has to stop somewhere and there has to be a draw, line drawn in the sand. You know, at that point, you have to have the ability to make concessions. And so, you know, there, that's the crossover where it becomes messy, you know, and if things go bad, you know, or this, this guy has this tile, why, why am I being forced to change this, whatever. Um, so there is a little bit of unknown that I, I'm, I'm assuming, especially now with all these soft brands occurring, that will inevitably come to a head where, where you know, on, on a legal side, contracts can become difficult. But, um, you know, um, hopefully by then there'll be experts that can say, yes, this is on par of, of that ilk. Interesting. Other questions from the audience? We anticipate people bringing their own entertainment. So we are in the process of rolling this out where you can stream from your iPad or from your phone onto your television. But you're absolutely right. The biggest hiccup on that is Wi-Fi speed. And so part of the implementation of this streaming service is to enhance the Wi-Fi for, for the property. So you know it it's, takes time to get there but we understand that people travel with multiple devices and you're absolutely right. They, they don't want to necessarily watch the cable in that particular market. Um, yeah, they want to have the food in that location and they want to go to the museums in that location, but they want their TV, right? They want their movies and they want their sports. Um, so they want to be able to sort of pack that with them. So that, that's definitely something that we see and we're working to sort of get there. And I think because it is, so much of it is portable and, and your personal devices, it's. It's really about providing the best display you can in the room. Absolutely. And, um, that's a really important um, component to it. And I think going forward, that's probably going to be you know, more of the focus. Mitch, you want to and, and keeping it simple. You know, everybody, like you've mentioned, having that residential, my own home experience, being able to 
say, all right, I want to watch my Netflix or Hulu or whatever. And, and I actually think the rooms here did a great job of trying to incorporate those, those into the into really big TV, too. Um, so, you know, it's, and that's nice. And, and, you know, in New York, you may not have a really big TV. So coming to a place like this, it's like, wow, this is actually an upgrade from my apartment. But, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's keeping it simple because if the, the more that you have to navigate around, I don't want to put my password in here, but if you just feel like one simple thing, boom, 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 I'm going to use it. I'm, and I'm, but at the same token, it's also, like you said, you know, people aren't watching the TVs. I, I happen to like watching local news. I think it's neat to see a little local color. But beyond that, I don't, you know, I'm going to watch my Netflix. Right. Yeah. We probably have time for one more question. Anybody? Right here. Absolutely. I mean, you've walked through the lobby here and you've seen that great little market that we in installed here. And the Regency brand and actually the Grand brand, we're doing um, a lot of these new markets because people want that flexibility. They don't want to have to do a sit-down meal. Um, we can minimize when appropriate um, in-room dining because you can grab it and you can take it to your room or you can grab it and you can eat it there. And then some of our brands, we've actually partnered with Grubhub and they're doing delivery service for us on, on the Centric brand. So I think it's also understanding who sort of the target demographic is of your particular brand and, and sort of the niche of the location um, and, and really giving those people what they want. Um, we're not gonna remove room service from a Park Hyatt. The, the expectation is that you're going to have a white linen tablecloth and silver service when you're at a park. But when you're at a Centric, you're a different kind of guest. Um, you're someone who, the reason Grubhub seemed like a really good match for us in Centric is that Grubhub is going to bring you the best of local cuisine, ethnic cuisine, neighborhood cuisine. And that, that is the Centric guest. They really want to understand where they're staying, and they want to participate in the neighborhood. So if they're not dining in the restaurant, which many of our centric um, restaurants are actually outsourced, so they're not Hyatt run, um, we can at least bring in the neighborhood to them. So we're playing around with in-room. And, and for us, I mean, the, you know, the room service aspect is, is still very viable, um, but the expectation is, is that it's not coming from you know, the three meal a day restaurant. It's coming from any of the other um, food and beverage outlets that are that are in a property, so you're, you know, you might have access to six other food and beverage outlets on any given property, and the expectation is that they're able to draw from that, but enjoy it in their room. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, unless we have any other questions, I think we're practically out of time at this point. So I'd like to thank everyone, thank the panel, obviously. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Join us. Yeah.